The Unshackled Waves, episode 196. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. We are finally back for a news review show, an extended one, so warning from the beginning, this will be a long episode so we can catch up and comment on all the news that has occurred over this past fortnight. So let's get straight into it and welcome back to the show at last, the political editor of The Unshackled, Michael Smythe. Michael, welcome back to the show. It's good to be back, Tim. Now, we were going to do an in-person episode when I was up in Brisbane for Liberty Fest, but that was such a crazy weekend that it uh, didn't end up eventuating. Mm, it was a lot of fun, but like you said, we ran out of time, sadly. So apologies to our subscribers and viewers that we could not give you a day after a Liberty Fest podcast. But we're back now and, wow, where do we start? I think uh, probably one of the most prominent topics this week that which we should discuss is uh, Pauline Hanson's It's OK to be White uh, motion in the Senate this week. Now, she gave her intention to put this motion forward uh, weeks beforehand, so it wasn't just sprung on the, on the Senate. Now, it failed uh, 28 votes to 31. The reason it was so close is because the uh, Morrison government uh, s supported it and so everyone was was quite pleased that wow they uh, uh, because the the left and the the media they were all horrified by this motion but uh, 24 hours later the the government uh, withdrew its support for the motion and blamed it on an administrative error <laughs> uh, yeah um they can say what they like but the reality is that it wasn't an admin error it was sim quite simply it was their honest honestly their indifference to you know race or skin color i mean that's why they're saying it's okay be white. i mean you look at uh senator amanda stoker on the bolt report the other day when he when he asked her the question said look she she laughed and said of course it's okay be white. it's okay to be any color that's what she said so, you know, I mean, I didn't watch the rest of the interview, but the thing is, it's just, <laughs> of course, it's okay to be white. The fact that the government initially supported the motion and then turned around and said, no, we're not supporting it, we are, or worse, we only supported it because of an admin error. It's either incompetence or dishonesty. And, you know, which one do you say is worse? Now, apparently this administrative error had happened in Attorney General uh, Christian Porter's office because they interpreted the motion, uh, I would say correctly, as an anti-racism motion. And that's why Pauline Hanson put it forward. It was not just saying it's okay to be white, but calling out examples of anti-white racism. So it actually wasn't an error on the the part of Christian Porter's staffers who got throw, thrown under the bus. Uh, but... It was actually that uh, the Morrison government, they, they ended up believing uh, the, the media outrage and, uh, and also from the left that was being fed to them, that this was a, a white supremacist motion. Mm, exactly. And the thing is, and I'm rather disappointed in the Liberal Party um, over this, not because they are what some people might consider to be, you know, cucks in inverted commas but for the fact that they don't have the conviction to stick behind their choices, their decision-making, they don't have the conviction behind it. It's just, it's abhorrent to me. Yeah, and this was, uh, the, the, the left and the media, they're going on, oh, this is a phrase, it's okay to be white, used by uh, neo-Nazis, uh, white supremacists, uh, the, the, the Ku Klux Klan, and therefore, uh, if, if one of those groups uses it, then the, the rule is you're not allowed to use it in any context uh, uh, whatsoever, which means, by, by that logic, yeah. that uh, we're not allowed to practice environmentalism, because the, the Nazis, the they Nazis were environmental. And there was exactly. actually an ABC article this week that said, 
said that environmentalism was a Nazi phenomenon. So are people going to say to the Greens now, <laughs> oh, you're, you're practicing a, a Nazi fascist philosophy? Well, uh, there'd probably be some trolls, mostly us, who would actually say that semi-ironically to the Greens. <laughs> but that's another thing as well, Tim. Hitler was a vegetarian. You don't want to be vegetarian because Hitler was a vegetarian. Godwin's law much? Yeah, you know, and he also drank Hitler water, was... Hitler. Yeah, he also drank water. He also breathed air. He also loved dogs. Ooh. <laughs> if you do any of those things, you're a fucking genocidal, mass-murdering maniac. Really? Can't have that, can we? For, for crying out loud. Sorry, I've never censored myself here, but for crying out loud, come on. Just because... Just because... A racist says it's okay to be white doesn't doesn't negate the um, the validity of the statements doesn't invalid doesn't invalidate the objectivity of the statement. I mean, you know, I mean, you've got black supremacists like the Black Panther movement who say, you know, black power, black power, so forth and so forth. Do they get accused of being racist? No, well except by maybe ironically white nationalists they might the same with the um uh, the la raza movement in the southern united states and so forth and so forth. i could go on until i could go on all night but we've got a program to run you know just because someone says something or is associated with something the character of the person does not necessarily negate the objectivity of said comment of said statement. It's like Andrew Bolt, for example. I mean, how many of us actually watching like Andrew Bolt? Just because some of us think Andrew Bolt is a jerk. I'm not one of them, by the way, Bolty, so don't get cranky. That doesn't invalidate what he says, necessarily. It doesn't invalidate it because he's a jerk. It validates it if it's objectively wrong. But if it's not objectively wrong, then the only reason you're picking on it is because he, it, of the person saying it, then that's very, very bad argumentation, and you need to pull your head out. Uh, we should establish where this phrase, it's okay to be white, really came from. And it was originally a 4chan troll, that glorious uh, uh, bastion of pop culture, 4chan. <laughs> of course, where 4chan. <laughs> everyone decided it would be a good slogan to try and sol troll the social justice warriors because they'd become so anti-white in their rhetoric you know white people are responsible for everything that's wrong with modern society uh white people today are responsible for injustices that happened four or five hundred years ago and so it snowballed from there uh, into real life where uh, people on 4chan thought hey why don't we stick these posters around to see what reaction we would get and, and of course the the reaction was oh these are horrible uh, racist signs pro proving the point that the social justice warriors don't believe that being white's okay that's that, that's how this became uh, a phrase and of course it was worn by uh lauren southern when she arrived in australia because or well, she had done the the documentary in uh, South Africa about the white South African farmers where uh, at the moment it's not okay to be white uh, for them or can f even cost you your life there. Mm -hmm. And it's cost several hundreds if not thousands of people their lives already, unfortunately. It's... I, I, I don't know what, what more I can say on this, Tim. It's just, you know, it's okay to be white. It's okay to be any colour. It's okay to be you, uh, as long as you're not committing any crimes or trying to subvert your society or trying to wreck your community, be whatever. Who cares? The fact that this motion was not passed goes to show that the, the encroachment of cultural Marxism through our institutions and through our mainstream media is complete. You know, I mean, white people are now on the whole ashamed of being white because they believe what the cultural Marxists tell them, the politically correct brigade and these social justice warriors. It's just, you know, you know what? I'm going to say it. I'm proud to be white. I'm happy to be white. It's okay to be white. It's okay to be any color. It's like, it's like Amanda, sorry, it's like Senator Stoker said, it's okay to be white. It's okay to be any color. There's nothing racially charged about that. Yeah, I'm fine with being white. That's what that's how I put it. And exactly. 
Now, the, the government, they didn't make the same administrative error later in the week when they voted down Senator Fraser Anning's proposal to uh, have a, a plebiscite on further uh, immigration to Australia. Uh, they, they seem to have, uh, the, the government uh, gone with the Labor and Greens line saying, how dare you, you know, speak out against, you know, wonderful uh, immigration. So that's being uh, shot down. And now it seems that even the, the, the Cata Party leadership itself is beginning to, to cuck out because they're sort of putting Fraser Anning on notice that, uh, or if you, if you don't shut up about this, where you, you're out. I was actually going to point that out, but you've done that for me. There was an article um, that came out yesterday afternoon um, saying, oh, there's this big um, hullabaloo in the Cater Party offices regarding um, regarding Fraser Anning's comments that are supposedly against Cater Party policy. But without going too far into it, technically his ad-libbing is technically against one of their policies not the substance of the policy itself but the extent of which he is at living is against the um against the policy anyway that's a, another topic for another time because i suspect we'll be discussing this on another show um if fraser Anning gets the boot from the cater party the thing is you know a lot of people in australia don't actually mind immigration it's just that people want it controlled people want people who are from compatible cultures compatible backgrounds coming in people who aren't going to try and force their way of life upon the rest of us that's what they want it's not that people oppose immigration it's that the people oppose unfettered immigration plus we've got so much infrastructure that needs work if we can't lend in as many people as we want, it's just not economically viable. And the irony of the Scott Morrison government and actually every Labour and Liberal government for that matter saying, but it's good, immigration is good for the economy. Is it? Is it really that good for the economy? Because the fact of the matter is you've got traffic, traffic travel times from home to homes to work, like workplaces taking even longer now than they did even five years ago. You've got further strains on utilities, public transport, and I'm, of course I mentioned the private transport already. You've also got the fact that, um, <laughs> you've also got, there's so many reasons why unfettered immigration is a problem. It's not just about, oh, we don't like those people. We do like those people. We do like people. We like everyone. We'll we'll give we'll give them we'll give them a hard time. We yank their chain, but we like them. That's what we do. We're Aussies, but we cannot afford, with the unemployment rate being so high, we cannot afford to keep on bringing in more and more people until we have the infrastructure in place and water reserves in place and energy reserves in place for that matter to offset the extra burden on the infrastructure. I remember reading somewhere we were 33 years ahead, ahead of schedule, more to the point our infrastructure is 33 years behind because our immigration intakes have skyrocketed. So what do we do, you know? Well, of course, people are going to want a plebiscite. Is it a is it a deal breaker in terms of voting for a political party? Not yet, but if they keep this, but if the governments keep this up, it might become a deal breaker. Yeah, this uh, groundswell of support for a, a plebiscite on immigration. I mean, it's just going to continue to, to fester. I mean, the major parties have killed it for now, but this is going to be an issue whether they they like it or not. Another uh, news story uh, that uh, shot to, to prominence over the past week was the alt-right uh, infiltration of the New South Wales Young Nationals. Uh, well, that was what their uh, ABC's Radio National Background Briefing mm. uh, program put, put yeah. forward. Now, the, if I bring up the, the story now, it was called Haircuts and Hate, The Rise of Australia's Alt-Right. 
And it basically, they, they teamed up with this uh, Antifa website called the, the White Rose Society, and they revealed that members of the Lad Society in Sydney had become members of the New South Wales uh, Young Nationals uh, Party. Now, for those who don't know lads is a local nationalist uh, men's uh, club with clubhouses in uh, melbourne and sydney probably their most prominent uh, spokesperson he's not the leader is uh blair cottrell and of course the the unshackled was mentioned in this uh abc background beefing report uh, <laughs> my interview with uh, Blair Cottrell at the the Lad Society Clubhouse in Melbourne was uh, featured. Uh, we we were referred to as an alt right uh, website. Now I was quite pleased that the the ABC decided to mention us <laughs> by name. Like I don't care. Well, if the ABC thinks we're you know alt right, that's hardly that's hardly going to destroy us. I'm actually, I, I, I you know Tim, we should be mad, but I'm just too amused. Yeah. I mean, I mean, okay. Let let let's go through for the benefit of our listeners and also for those morons at the ABC, let's go through a brief profile of the everyone from the editor-in-chief down to our newest contributor, shall we? You want to do that? Ah, uh, no, we haven't got time. Ah, oh, ruined my fun. Yeah, so the, all these uh, lads involved in the, the National Party were, were all revealed. So um, there was uh, Clifford Jennings, Nicholas Walker, Oscar Tuckerfield, Stuart Churchill, and Thomas Brasher. And then there was two non-lads who were part of the New South Wales Young Nuts. That, that was Justin uh, Bular and uh, Lisa uh, Sanford. <laughs> I'll let you, uh, do you, how much do you know about Clifford Jennings, by the way? Oh, well, yeah, I know that uh, he, oh, I know that he's uh, the main person behind uh, Lads in Sydney. And yeah, he's he's been around the, the nationalist movement for uh, a number of years now. And this was his uh, big uh, project, uh, which has obviously become, come crashing, crashing down. Um, now, a lot of what was used in this ABC story was content taken from uh, personal profiles. They managed to friend a lot of these people, and also the New Guard Facebook group, which is uh, which was a nationalist startup group. And there was a lot of damaging uh, comments from people such as uh, Clifford and and others. A lot of fourteen eighty eight shit posts, which of course that's that that's enough to to sink all of them it's absolutely freaking retarded to be honest let's call a spade a spade if you're gonna for, if you're gonna unironically post 1488 related material kiss any chance of a political career goodbye it's just it's the kiss of death it is to a millennials oh sorry a right-wing millennials political career what the Zimmerman telegram was to the Ramsay MacDonald government of the United Kingdom in the 1920s but why the reason I asked you about Clifford if you how much you knew about Clifford Clifford used to be a member of the Liberal Party just yeah he's like been around for a number of years if um, yeah it was, I, it was... I actually met Clifford when I was in the Liberal Party um for a young Liberal convention and you know I've remained on I mean, we don't speak often, but when we speak, we speak quite warmly towards each other. I didn't take him for an extremist, either, th certainly not then, and I don't know how much of it is humour. I don't think he's changed. I hope he hasn't changed like that, but at the end of the day, it's... It, it, people, people say, oh, the old rights don't take over the nationals. It's not like the alt-right hasn't tried to take over the nationals before, or the liberals for that matter. It's like how communists have taken, successfully in some cases, taken over the Labour Party. It's called branch stacking. Everybody does it. And I'm not saying it's right. It's definitely not right. But everybody does it, Tim. And this whole, this friggin' sorry excuse for a background briefing from the apparatchik bullshit alex mann was the the reporter you can you you can basically if you go onto his twitter he's basically been bragging the past week about because abc milked this for like 
uh, our whole week. Like uh, they did uh, ABC it's News articles news. about it. There was a feature <laughs> on uh, AM about it. Yeah, it is old news because Andrew Connell from the Australian did a story on uh, the the young New South Wales Young Nats AGM uh, earlier mm -hmm. in this year, which uh, named uh, Clifford. But it was the, the well the ABC investigation went a lot deeper and got into these facebook profiles and groups so it was a bit bit more thorough but yeah you're right on there mm. oh the the most of the information that that, that um alex man would have gone would have been fed to him from uh factional enemies of clifford's little sub faction anyway they wouldn't have had the initiative to do it on their own oh, yeah, let me was... that they might have had the initiative but they wouldn't have had the ability to do it on their own and that's how that's how every time you see it hear about or see a scandal in a political party it's usually because someone from within another faction of the same party has leaked against him or her so the uh, new south wales young national who started this digging process was a uh person named Ethan Gordon and well he's pretty much what is the new establishment in the the National Party now everyone thinks of the the National Party as a rural conservative party but has actually been taken over by young socially regressive people now and he was apparently this guy Ethan triggered by uh, these uh, anti uh, immigration motions uh, being put forward at the the AGM and so he started looking around who Clifford Jennings and uh, these other people uh, were and so this is snowballed uh, from there and one other thing you also have to uh, keep in mind is that these Antifa groups whether it's the White Rose Society or whatever other uh, group they are they, they go to really extensive lengths to like dig up stuff on people uh, I mean because they think they're fighting against Nazis who are going to kill everybody and so they they take this all very seriously and so that's why they were able to the the white rose society has like so many screenshots on it of various groups and that it's like yeah yeah like it's it's quite extensive mm, mm. yeah the funny thing is about the whole the new guard or the group that calls itself the new guard they're civic nationalists they're not even Nazis. They're not even Natsok. I mean, yeah, there are a few people who are probably unironically national socialist, but the ethos of the new guard is technically multi-ethnic and monocultural. It's not even Nazi. I mean, you know, if, if well, the thing is, people are so ready to believe that anyone to the right of Karl Marx is a Nazi now. By that flawed logical thinking, you and I to the right of Hitler, people who are people who make us look like Karl Marx, must be Satan himself or something. You know, there's the, you know, there's no there's no nuance in thought anymore. People throw around the word fascist or Nazi like it's you know like it's coming out of style. There are very few people who are legitimately fascist, and there are even fewer yet, more, even fewer yet again, who are actual Nazis. But yeah, this is why, you know, these 1488 shit posts, and for those who don't know what 1488 means, for, uh, for 14 refers to the 14 words for white nationalists, which is, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children, and 88 stands for the letter H, Hail Hitler, so that's pretty self explanatory so if that's ever in a political group then it doesn't matter if you say you're a civic nationalist group that's that's the end mm, that's true because even if you remind everyone that you're a civic nat group they're still going to accuse you of being a nazi because of the stupidity of other people who decide to do as we so succinctly put it shit posts which means I have to probably go through my profile and make sure that people saying too many edgy things are, you know, not um, <laughs> not noted at, at this point. Well, the, the True Blue Crew, they're a civic nationalist organisation. Even they're labelled 
Nazis because there was a, a piece this week from the Australian of all places because the True Blue Crew Queensland, they organised a anti-safe schools rally on the same uh, weekend that Liberty Fest uh, was happening. It was actually just across the road from where we were at Liberty Fest mm. and uh, Fraser Anning spoke at it and this uh, Rick Morton, the social affairs reporter at the Australian, we're, we're doing good at naming and shaming people tonight. Uh, I, I'm very pleased. Oh, lefty journalists don't deserve any favours from us. They hmm. wouldn't give us it. They wouldn't give us any quarter. We shouldn't give them any quarter either. Yeah. So the so the headline was in the Australian that Fraser Anning addresses neo Nazi rally and and uh, tried to uh, attach that to to Liberty Fest, which it was. Yeah. They, were, they, were two, they were two separate events, and the event that Fraser Anning spoke at was. Uh, uh, anti-safe schools event it was just organized by the the true blue crew i mean the whole thing was uh it, 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 he didn't even get hardly any of his facts right it was just so terrible so not even so-called you know fascist mouthpiece news corp is uh <laughs> it, it, can, it, can, it can be considered you know uh, a friend of the right oh murdoch is only interested in himself and his money Murdoch will, Murdoch will be as right wing as. How, let me actually let me start that again. Murdoch will go left or right, depending on how much money he can make out of it. The more money he can make, the more hard he will go in a certain direction. It is that simple. Yeah. And so, I, yeah. Sorry, there was one other thing. If I were the if I were the organizers of Liberty Fest, I would be sending the Australian a, um, not a cease and desist notice, that's not the right phrase. I would be sending them a demand to retract since their, since the articles attempt to link TBC and Liberty Works together. I mean, Liberty Works, Liberty Fest, they're libertarians. And TBC are... Well, not libertarians, shall we say. <laughs> Mostly nice people, but they're not libertarians. They are pretty far apart. So in the aftermath of the, the ABC and the White Rose Society investigation, the, the Young Nationals, New South Wales executive, they terminated the, the Metropolitan Officer that was held by Clifford Jennings and the Fundraising Officer that was held by uh, Lisa Sanford and suspended the other people uh, involved or mentioned in this uh, story pending a investigation by their uh, ethics uh, committee. Uh, but I think we can pr be pretty certain that uh, this... Uh, infiltration is sort of that's that's a sinister word i would say attempt to change from within that's the that's the the more noble uh, term to use it's it's completely over now and of course uh, senior national party figures such as uh, uh, troy grant and tim fisher said oh we will not tolerate you know this kind of hate in our party we are not a haven for for these type of hate people so this oh, experiment or attempt, what we call it, it's it's finished. And so, for you know, nationalists who want to uh, try and change mainstream political parties, it's back to the drawing board. Yeah. Well, here's a here's a pro tip, guys. If you if you are actually no, I don't think I mean I don't think any legitimate Nazis actually watch this show, so there's no point me saying it. But what I was going to say is, if you're going to infiltrate a political party. Keep your freaking Nazism to yourself. Don't let on about it to anyone. Keep the cover up so much that when you do eventually have the opportunity to do whatever sick, twisted fantasy you want to play out, no one will be any the wiser. Let's turn on to there. Uh, there was uh, some significant uh, activism last weekend in both Melbourne and Brisbane. Uh, there was the uh, annual pro-life March for the Babies uh, in Melbourne, which uh, I attended, uh, which had about uh, 500 attendees. It's led every year by Bernie Finn, who's a state liberal MLC. And there was also one in Brisbane, a March for Life, because that, uh, the abortion decriminalization bill was voted upon this week. 
Mm, that's right. And despite the protests against it and, pardon me, and the fact that there was actually one Labor member of Parliament that crossed the floor to vote against it, the bill and, and another Labor MP who actually abstained, the, the decriminalisation bill still passed um, 50 to 41 with two abstentions. Um, it's probably a good thing that we didn't do this podcast last night because I was actually quite angry about um, yeah. this bill. Uh, it was sickening, like all the, you know, women, like, you know, hugging uh, about this, that this was well, uh, basically on par with, you know, something like passing, like, same-sex marriage. Like, yeah, we can, like, kill children up until, like, birth now. Like, that's nothing to, you know celebrate and like get emotional about like i just found that so sick mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and here's the here's the thing and i pointed this out and i got i drew a lot of flat from this from from a lefty of course um i drew a lot of flat by pointing out the the fact is that abortions happen in queensland are being prosecuted anyway Ever since 1986, I believe it was, there was a ruling handed down by the Supreme Court of, Qu- of Queensland that said that if a woman's life was, je- a woman's health was jeopardised, an abortion would be allowed. And even in cases where that is not the case, where it is um, done for other reasons than health, They've never enforced it. The only time they enforced it was when some couple somewhere in central Queensland illegally imported RU486. The problem, the biggest problem of all, however, with this bill, it is not the fact that, you know, women supposedly have, women now have reprodu- reproductive rights. It's not the fact that um, <laughs> doctors are forced to refer um, patients on to other doctors who have no compunction about killing babies it's the fact that this law once it's granted assent will create the potential for the carte blanche for rather uh, abortion on demand you know you can have sex selective abortion now so if you have a, if you and your wife are trying for a baby and you both want a boy but you end up becoming pregnant with a girl you can you you can cite that as a you can technically cite that as a reason i'm not saying that people would do that but it can happen i mean it happened in china i mean how many infanticides happened in china under the one child policy and so forth and so forth i could go i could go on about this until i'm blue in the face but the thing is i asked a friend of mine who used to work for the government yesterday i asked him you must acknowledge that the legalization of sorry, the decriminalization bill has now passed, allows babies to be killed on a whim. Objectively speaking, is that correct? And he admitted, yes, that is correct. And it's just, you know, it's, it's horrible. I mean, there the were allowances always made for exceptions previously. This law removes conscientious objection, and it's just abhorrent yeah it's basically the same as the law we've had in victoria for the past 10 years and this year's march it was the 10th anniversary of the passing of the victorian uh, abortion law reform uh, act which well since in that 10 years 200,000 babies have been murdered enough to fill two mcgs which is uh, i mean it's it's horrific to to hear that mm. and where this march has been held every year and the sad thing is that neither of the major parties have uh, sh- have showed any willingness to want to revisit uh, this issue like since 2008 we've had uh, both uh, labor and coalition governments um it's uh, there's not many uh, people t- uh, candidates who are promoting their their pro-life views in this uh, election and it's it's very demoralizing uh, pro lact activism in Australia. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is. 
is extremely demoralizing. And the Queensland laws are almost a carbon copy, almost mm. an exact carbon copy of the Victorian laws. That has all, all the exclusion zones, we have them now as well. Even though it was always possible to get an abortion anyway, and the risk of prosecution was virtually non-existent. But hey, you, let's, you know, let's just, let's just have it so that anyone can get an abortion on a whim or because it's inconvenient. The only good thing, and I, I will, I will actually provide a counter argument to, against my own argument, um, because we are objective at the Unshackled and we do pride ourselves on being objective. The... One of the things that was pointed out, and this is by someone who works in nursing, incidentally, uh, he pointed out to me that these laws do protect the doctor from any criminal prosecution. That's a given. But he also pointed out that the fact is the woman who's seeking a pregnancy or has a pregnancy can't then change her mind and try and sue the doctor and strip him or her of their medical license. That is one, I guess you could say that is arguably one plus of the bill, but at the same time, one plus out of all the other problems that I've mentioned and the problems that I haven't mentioned, it's kind of, mm, it's, still very grim now at the melbourne march we had a counter protest by uh, our local antifa which is the campaign against racism and fascism which i found quite confusing because weren't nazis and fascists weren't they in favor of killing the the vulnerable in society and weren't the people marching there weren't they wanting to protect the the, the vulnerable like that didn't make much sense and one of the uh, counter-protesters, who's uh, a man known by the name of Ed Sheeran, because he looks like uh, Ed Sheeran with his red hair, uh, yelled out, kill all the babies. He, he yelled that out at the counter-protest, then went into the crowd uh, during one of the speakers and shouted, kill them, kill them all. Then when security... Uh, approached him, he fell to the ground, played dead, and he was uh, eventually uh, handcuffed by police and, and taken away. Now, uh, Neil Erickson, who attended the, uh, the March for the Babies, he uncovered who Aid Sheeran was. His name is Matt uh, Costella. Uh, so uh, we now know uh, who he is. Um, which, which is always good when we're able to dox uh, leftists. But yeah, uh, he was given the nickname Age Sheeran by um, our uh, producer here, uh, Morgan, because he was featured <laughs> in the, the, the calf protest outside Lauren Southern and, and mm. Stefan Molyneux. But no, that, that, that's, he is the, the perfect encapsulant of uh, the, the people uh, opposing... Like people marching for life. I mean, if you're going to shout out, you know, kill, kill, kill them all, that you know you love, you know, terminations, then that pretty much says all there is about your movement. Mm. Love is love, Tim. Don't be such a bigot. <laughs> but that's uh, that's the grim reality of it. They don't care. They only care about their own pathologically driven agenda. And you know, it's like you know. Most of them, someone pointed out to me the other day that most people who are pro-choice are not pro-choice on a whim. And that's generally true. But when you have some disgusting reprobate like Costella saying, kill all babies, kill them all, it's like, well, you know what? You are you are not helping your cause and you all you're going to do is make the pro-life activists double down in defending life even yours you smarmy little ugh he's a disgrace to gingers everywhere that <laughs> little pig that little piggies are disgraced to gingers everywhere now, I mentioned that uh, Neil Erickson was in attendance, uh, a, pr a prominent uh, patriot provocateur uh, in Melbourne. Uh, he had an eventful day because he got 
turfed out of a, a bar uh, in uh, Melbourne transport uh, bar because his offsider Bluebeard unfurled uh, one of the, the banners that he, that he took to the march, which was of bloody uh, aborted uh, fetuses and security didn't like that mm. and, and threw them out. So that was another interesting sideshow uh, of the day. Yeah, because I actually saw a little bit of the video. You can actually hear one of our mutual friends yelling, why are you kicking him out? Why are you kicking him out? And I have to admit, before you told me this, because I hadn't seen footage of the incident leading up to him getting kicked out, I had only seen the getting kicked out part it was interesting to see that, you know, there was actually some provocation on Neil's part and well, not so much Neil's part, but um, Bluebeard's part. And it's like, <sighs> on the one hand, they had every right to make their point and they sh we shouldn't be judging them or condemning them for that. But on the other hand as well, in a bar where people want to relax and unwind and not necessarily be political, yeah, there's a time and a place, you know. I mean, it's a time and a place thing. I mean, I'm not going to judge them for what they did. I'm just going to I'm just going to make the comment that it was probably ill advised at that place. Now, the Wentworth by-election is uh, finally upon us, and it's pretty much a two-horse race now between the Liberal candidate Dave Sharma and high-profile independent uh, Dr. Karen uh, Phelps. Uh, the Labor candidate uh, Tim Murray is, is running dead. There's a field of 16 candidates, so everyone's having a, a crack at it. And now the, the Liberals there, it was Malcolm Turnbull's seat, uh, he obviously resigned from Parliament when he uh, lost the Prime Ministership and is now in exile in New York. He hasn't campaigned for, for Dave Sharma uh, at all. Uh, but because it was Turnbull's seat, uh, the, the Liberals, uh, they're having to uh, placate uh, progressives. And so uh, the people in this seat, because it's the, the wealthiest electorate in Australia, uh, they're passionate about issues like climate change and... Uh, refugees, uh, hence why Turnbull was, was so left-wing as uh, yeah, when he was in Parliament and as Prime Minister. Mm. You're going to ask me who, who do I think is going to win, aren't you? Oh, sure. We always like a prediction. <sighs> I'm sorry to disappoint, Tim. I, to me, it's a dead heat because the thing is, Dave Sharma, and I was thinking about this today, Dave Sharma should have been a shoe in I still think he, long story short, I still think Sharma will win, but only just. He should have, he should be, to come tomorrow night, he should be rocking it in by 7.30pm. That's a 17% margin that Turnbull had. Yes, but you've got to remember as well, Dave Sharma is not really well known outside um, diplomatic circles. Um, Karen Phelps, on the other hand, Dr. Karen Phelps, on the other hand, is a former president of the Australian Medical Association and one and a well-known lobbyist who has a household name and has a, even now still has a substantial profile. She... I mean, she should be running for the Greens, if you want my honest opinion. She should be running for the Greens. But she has, because she's running as an independent, albeit with a Labour Party-affiliated consultant helping her out, mm. um, because she's running as an independent and because the people of Wentworth may want to punish the Liberal Party for either for rolling Turnbull or for the fact that Turnbull decided to turn tail and run the moment he knew he couldn't save his save his um position as prime minister so you know karen phelps actually has a strong chance and obviously all the other candidates well not all the other candidates well most of the other candidates will probably preference her over um sharma 
So it's going to be a lot closer than it should be. I do, like I said, I do still think that Sean will win, but it'll be very close. And there is a possibility that we might not even know for a few days who actually will win. Well, the the polling, uh, there, there was internal liberal polling that was uh, leaked that uh, put Karen Phelps... Uh, 55 45 ahead on two party preferred so most of the commentators think the the momentum is with her also another key uh, demographic of uh, wentworth is it's got a high uh, jewish uh, vote uh, dave sharma was a former ambassador to, to israel and uh, karen phelps she actually converted to, to judaism because her uh, wife's jewish so there's a lot in the in the two major candidates for Jewish voters to, to like. And uh, everyone thought it was a strange coincidence that in the, the week leading up to the Wentworth by-election, the uh, Morrison government said that they were considering moving Australia's embassy in Israel from uh, Tel Aviv uh, to the, the capital, Jerusalem, which the, the United States has done, which is, well, it is the capital, Jerusalem, but of course it, it stirs up a lot of tension with the, the Palestinian Arabs if... Uh, such a move is made. Mm, mm, mm. Plus, it's going to cost us money, and it's not really going to make much of a difference in terms of um, networking towards a peace process anyway, because most of the other countries' embassies are already in Tel Aviv. I mean, we don't exactly have the money to move our embassy there. I mean, sure, we could. There's no, not necessarily going to be any harm done if we do, but there's no need for it. Anyway, that's... That's besides the point. There has been pressure on the government for a little while to follow Trump's lead and move the Australian embassy to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv, but it definitely had a coincidental uh, boost when um, ScoMo mentioned it last week. And what also happened in the, the past few days is that there was a smear against uh, Karen Phelps that mm. claiming that she was uh, dropping out of the uh, race because she had HIV, which she is like obviously associating her like homosexuality with HIV AIDS. And like it was, it, it was clearly like a ludicrous thing to uh, put out. And uh, also, the email said to, to vote for, for Dave Sharma. I don't know how that how anyone's right mind in the seat of Wentworth, which had like 80% support for same-sex marriage, why anyone would think that that was uh, a good idea to, to put that out. I have a suspicion that it was a false flag by some leftist activists there to uh, try and smear the, the liberals as uh, spreading a, a homophobic rumor that's how i see it because it was from an anonymous email account we don't know who it was from it's been referred to the aec the afp whoever's role it is to uh, investigate and of course dave sharma said it's you know disgusting vile you know it wasn't authorized by me and of course we believe him mm. of course it was absolutely abhorrent and disgusting i mean you know if you want to smear your opponents fine smear your opponents but there's some things you just don't do and that thing that email is an example of things you just don't do. Also, Tim, I didn't realize it was conspiracy theory hour. If you told me that, I would put my tinfoil hat on. <laughs> oh, I don't think it's the realm of possibility. I mean, left us play dirty. I mean, this would be a good false flag. Mm, maybe, but it's still just a theory for now. I mean, you know, it, it may turn out that you're actually correct. I mean, there have been some times where certain um, perpetrators of certain incidents have turned out to be associated with um, left-wing political parties or children of members of left-wing political parties, in, especially in America. But the thing is, though, it's, it's a theory for now. The point is, the smear was disgusting, the email was disgusting, the person who wrote it should be ashamed of himself or herself, and in Australia, we have no room for... Mm. We, we're a civilised country. We do not have a room for such gutter talk. And that's just... Actually, no, that's lower than the gutter. That's the sewer. You know, I don't even necessarily like Karen Phelps, but, you know, I would never in a hundred million years 
even consider writing something so just abhorrent as that. Now, what the Liberals have tried to use against uh, Karen Phelps is that she let it slip in an interview with David Spears that she'd be open to a no-confidence motion against the government uh, in uh, certain circumstances which she didn't articulate. Now, uh, if she wins, then the Morrison government loses its one-seat majority. So this was uh, used by the Liberal Party that, hey, if you vote for Karen Phelps, you'll get... Uh, instability but given that it's only six seven months from an election uh i i i doubt that uh, even if she wanted to she's going to be able to cause too much she said she'll guarantee confidence and supply yeah but politicians lie all the time and the fact that she had even though she did say earlier at the beginning of the campaign that she would guarantee confidence and supply the fact that she has now said that she's open to a no confidence motion suggests that she is, well, she's not a friend to the Liberals, put it that way. Well, it's certainly going to be a, a tight race tomorrow for what it's, uh, or today when this podcast is put out. My uh, prediction is that I think Karen Phelps will, will get up. I think that there's uh, enough of the, the so-called doctor's wives there who are angry that their um, perfect uh, local MP and Prime Minister got turfed out, that they'll, they'll go with somebody who they think is, is like-minded in Karen Phelps. Mm. Well, the thing is, you might be right. I'm, not, I'm still going to stick with my prediction of Sharma, but, you know, I'm happy to be, well, actually... I'm not sure if I can say I'm happy to be wrong. It's just like, mm, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. So now we're moving on to last week's news. And the, the major story from last week was uh, gay kids getting expelled from uh, religious schools. Now, this uh, came from a, a leaked extract of the Philip Ruddick-led review into religious freedom, which was done in the wake of same-sex marriage passing. Now, what it said is that uh, faith-based schools, they should disclose that they don't accept uh, gay uh, students, that there should be that uh, disclaimer there. So there's uh, they don't suddenly spring on the child like if they come out that hey you have to have to leave the the school now now it is it will, well it was existing law that uh, schools uh, could could do this but it seemed to be that well it, it, there was not outrage directed about what the Ruddick review said but that this was actually currently uh, allowed and by the end of the week uh, both parties had pledged that uh, uh, they were going to protect uh, gay students and uh, that faith-based schools couldn't expel them and so for the after all that for the Ruddick uh, religious review wanting to protect religious freedom ended up with less religious freedom well gee there's a shock and the reason I say that is not to be snarky I'm saying that because of the fact that Every time religious freedoms or religious rights get discussed, they go backwards. They are reduced. They are diminished. You know, I mean, to be honest, in regards to gay or lesbian students in schools, I'm actually in two minds about that. I mean, there's, there's the, obviously there's the... Uh, what would you call the traditionalist part of me that says, you know, actually it's funny, the traditionalist and the libertarian part are actually in agreement here, you know, private institution, private ethos, follow ethos or GTFO. On the other hand, if you don't have the option of going to a state school, and your only option is a private school to receive education, should you be penalized for that? I don't think you should be penalized for, I'm, well, part of me doesn't think that people should be penalized for, you know, having a certain orientation or preference. It's just, I don't know. I, I think, you know, children are important and I'm not saying that in the sense of, you know, the rights of children supersede your institutional rights. I'm not saying that at all, as someone did insinuate this week. But what I am saying is that it's a lot more of a complicated 
um, issue than just saying, oh, let the gay students in or kick them out. It's a lot more complicated than that. The thing I really am bugged by, though, and I will actually still stick on the traditionalist and weird alliance of traditionalist and libertarian thought here, the the rights of religious schools to not hire gay teachers should be upheld because if you're working as as a an integral part of the institution and you have a different ethos that is in breach of the institutional ethos it's a bad fit it's a bad fit and you're not going to be able to do your job properly in that institution thus you should not be there and the managers of said institution have every right to make sure that everyone who is a part of the institution has the same ethos or is at least is compatible with the ethos. So I will say that, you know, this idea of protecting gay teachers from those evil religious schools, it's crap because every private institution has a right. Employees, I'm sorry, employees, employers discriminate all, all the time even if they don't acknowledge it they will discriminate all the time if they don't think you're going to play nice with others if they don't think you're a team player they won't hire you if they don't think you'll fit into the dominant subculture within work they won't hire you if they, you don't fit into the ethos of the company they won't hire you it's not oh. rocket science well, gay teachers, I think that's a, a separate uh, question because obviously religious schools, they want to uh, employ teachers who uh, will uh, teach the, the ethos of their religion to the students. And for a lot of religious schools, being gay doesn't fit in with that. But a lot of people believe that, well, students, it's, it, it's different because, like, uh, the school is in a position of care and and most um, uh, there was heaps of interviews with uh spokespeople for from religious schools and said like n like no we wouldn't like if we found out like a student was gay like we wouldn't kick him out like that's not that's not how it works we might sort of you know try to you know counsel them or you know we we just uh, let them be because like obviously if you enroll a, a six-year-old in a religious school obviously they have no sexuality at that time so you know as it's not as if that that that's the the intention to send well, they, they come out years years down the track so for students it's a it's a bit different but uh yeah really religious schools they sort of said well that's a that's a separate issue because you know we're, we're there to care for um uh, the students it's a more tricky uh, thing mm, exactly which is why i said i was in two minds about it and i re-emphasized re the fact that it is not an easy discussion or topic now the reason why the morrison government got flat-footed by this is uh, is basically because this uh, report it was kept secret and sat in Malcolm Turnbull, Scott Morrison, and Christian Porter's desk for for months, not doing anything. And so, of course, if you do, if you keep it top secret, if it leaks, then of course you you're not going to uh, control the narrative. And Scott Morrison uh, immediately after said, "Oh, we're not planning to change the existing law." Even Tanya Plibersek said said so. They uh, from the left of the Labor Party, but by weeks end, they pretty much they changed their tune. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, because it wasn't convenient for them. They had to change the narrative. Yeah, Both sides had to yeah. change the narrative. And Scott Morrison is obviously he's probably a bit sensitive about because it was the the week after that uh, footage of him praying for for rain had been leaked to the media, and so probably he was also a bit worried about you know I don't want to be seen as you know too crazy right wing Christian like you know here's my you know olive branch to the progressives. That and you know, I, I hate to speak badly of ScoMo, but there is an element of cowardice to it as well. I mean, he's a politician, and he also no owes his prime ministership to prudence. the moderates as well. Exactly, the moderates who hated Dutton because they thought wrongly that Dutton was Abbott's puppet, so they wanted to get 
Turnbull's guy in, which is Scott Morrison. Although, to Scott Morrison's credit, he is actually a much more effective and much more genuine leader than Turnbull, which admittedly isn't really hard, but you get the idea. I like Scott a lot better than I like Turncoat. I mean, Turnbull. Now, the issue that tore the nation apart last week was uh, advertising on the, the Sydney Opera House. Uh, now, there, there's, I, I didn't even know that there was this Everest horse race in Sydney until this whole thing uh, blew up. Well, the, the organisers of the Everest uh, race, they wanted to advertise it on the sales of the, the Sydney Opera House, which they've advertised a whole bunch of sporting events in the past. Now, the Opera House CEO, uh, Louise Heron, uh, she initially refused uh, the ads. And uh, this, this all blew up when she went on Alan Jones's uh, TGB show where uh, when, when he doesn't like somebody, he, he berates them uh, pretty, pretty intensely. <laughs> and it, it was quite a funny interview. Like uh, she's saying, oh, I, I, uh, uh, this, uh, it's not a billboard, the, the opera house. And Alan Jones is like, says who, who are you? Who, yeah. Who do you think you are? <laughs> uh, it's, it's quite entertaining now because, you know, Alan Jones, they don't like Alan Jones because he's a, a conservative and they consider him, uh, a, a misogynist. Uh, they were outraged. How dare uh, uh, because well they, they believe that Alan Jones he uh, he was able to convince Premier Gladys Berejiklian to reverse the decision I don't think it was as simple as Alan Jones picking up the phone to Gladys Berejiklian and that's mm. what happened but that's what the left uh, <laughs> believe and so yeah the, the left were enraged that this uh, bully uh, Alan Jones was able to, to, to get his way and yeah, they, they, they staged a, a big uh, protest when the, the ads uh, uh, took place and everyone was saying, wow, first world problems. Basically, yeah. For those of us, or those of our viewers who do not uh, know what the Everest horse race is, would you care to explain what the Everest horse race is? Yeah, or well, it's Sydney's attempt to... Uh, put on a, a horse race to rival the Melbourne Cup. I don't know. Well, Melbourne Cup's been around for over 150 years. I don't know how you can just invent one the past <laughs> couple of years and say, yeah, we're going to knock off the Melbourne Cup in, in terms of national significance. That's that's not going to happen. Well, that's <laughs> Melbourne and in me, <laughs> basically. Well, you, well, in fairness, I mean, I, I hate Victoria. You know I do, but you're not wrong. The thing is, you can't just change an institution. You can't supersede or knock off an institution overnight certainly not in the case of just a few mere years six minutes on the opera house that's not going to change it <laughs> six thousand years okay maybe not six thousand years um six thousand minutes on the opera house wouldn't change it either 60 <laughs> 60 days 60 weeks wouldn't change it and so forth and so forth and so forth how many models of 60 should i go to to further emphasize our point <laughs> i'm sorry i'm sorry but the thing is you're right we're not going to the people in sydney are not going to replace the melbourne cup with the everest horse racing i hadn't even heard of it you know when you're growing up you hear about the melbourne cup it's on the radio it's on the tv you can't get away from it you take half an hour or so off from classes to watch it in primary school just because it's the freaking Melbourne Cup. Who's heard about this Everest horse race? I hadn't heard of it either, to be honest. That's actually I why I asked you to explain to everyone what it was, because I wasn't quite sure what it was. Well, I suppose it did have the <laughs> desired effect, this controversy of letting letting the nation know what was the, the Everest uh, horse race, but whether this was good publicity, given that it was was so divisive, I mean that remains remains to be seen. I mean, uh, the old saying, any publicity is good publicity, but when uh, yeah, there's there's protests against your ads and the the uh, the ballot draw for the for the race has to be shut down because of security reasons. Um, I'm not sure. Mm. Yeah, I'm dubious as well. So the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released another uh, report. Now, of course, this is the climate alarmist organization. They said to keep 
the warming of the planet to 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius and to prevent more extreme weather, rising sea levels, we basically have to give up everything that's good about Western society. Uh, yeah, obviously, uh, have, uh, we have to have 45% uh, uh, renewable energy uh, by 2030. Sorry, 45% uh, emissions reduction by 2030 uh, from 2010 levels. But also we have to reduce our cons consumption of meat and dairy and, and drive less. So it basically is the, the Green Left manifesto that, you know, eating meat's bad. We, we need to all be vegetarians to save the planet. We can't, you know, drive these evil cars. We must, you know, be on our bicycles and public transport. And it made me think that if you, you know, if you hated... Uh, industrialization and you hate uh, and you obviously hated the fact that you know we eat animals and dairy products then you would love this report mm -hmm. just a friendly reminder ladies and gentlemen hitler was a vegetarian as well don't be don't be hitler <laughs> no but seriously though I, I'm, I'm gonna say something about this this report you know you you personally know my contempt for the United Nations organization. For those of you who don't know, I don't like the UN. I don't trust the UN. I think they are only interested in their own their own aggrandizement and their own you know expense accounts rather than the interests of the countries they're supposed to represent or steward. Now, this is the problem that I have with the whole oh. We affluent first world nations need to give up our our perks and our excessive lifestyles. No, we don't. When you look at the major polluters in the world, apart from the EU, the other four, uh, apart from the EU and the US, the other three are not first world. Russia, China, and India. China is the biggest um, is the biggest carbon emitter. Um, India is second, USA is third, EU is fourth. I'm oh, sorry, no, Russia is fourth, EU is fifth. And between just between Russia, India, and China, that is more than half of the world's global carbon emissions. Do you know how many what the percentage of Australia's carbon emissions is, Tim? It's 1.5%. 1.5% which has been acknowledged by even some of the most fanatical climate Cassandras out there as being completely inconsequential. Even if we were to go carbon neutral and reduce our carbon emissions to literally zero, it wouldn't make a difference to the temperature. It wouldn't decrease the temperature. It wouldn't stop sea levels rising. It wouldn't stop extreme weather, not to mention the fact that this is Australia. We've had extreme weather for centuries and millennia no, before we're an evil we had white western countries so of course we're going to get most of the blame and it's going to be on us to, to change even though as you said you know we we count for uh, hardly any of the the world's emission but all of society's ills they're blamed on white western countries or we're the ones who industrialize first so it's 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 our responsibility so we're going to, so basically the UN wants to punish us for being successful earlier than everyone else. There's no fairness in that, and that's another reason why I'm going to tell the UN where to shut it. Now, the major story to come out of the United States was that uh, Brett Kavanaugh was confirmed by the United States Senate as a justice of the Supreme Court in a 40 to 58 vote. Uh, now, Democrats, the, the left and the, the feminist lobby, they believe that Kavanaugh was a serial rapist because of this 35-year-old uh, allegation against him by uh, Christine Blasey Ford that uh, when she was 15, Kavanaugh was 17, uh, uh, he sexually assaulted her at a party which she doesn't know when or where it happened, neither can anyone else, but she knows that it's him. And yeah, that that was that that's apparently enough proof to convict him as a as a as a rapist. And then there was two other women who came forward and said, "Oh, uh, you know, he uh, sexually assaulted me as well." And now fe feminists they they 
of course, we, we know that they, they don't care about due process. They don't care about the presumption of innocence when it comes to rape accusations, but they believe Except that... Except if they're Democrats who are accused. I'm, I'm the last person in the world who's going to make trivialization of such egregious allegations to whether they be true or not. But you have to ask yourself why after, you said 35 years? 35 yeah. years. Is it only coming out now? There have been plenty of other judicial confirmations for Brett Kavanaugh. Yeah, he wasn't a I nobody. Come out then. Exactly. He's not a nobody. He's, he's known inside American jurisprudence as a somewhat conservative judge. It, it doesn't make sense. I don't know what the statute of limitations for rape cases is in America, but I believe it's something like 30 years. So why, why, if, if he did it, why let him off the hook? Why not pull, pull him in to account beforehand? Yeah. And before the statute lapses. And it's interesting that Christine Blasey Ford, now that Kavanaugh has been uh, confirmed, said she, oh, she won't pursue the matter further. I mean, that pretty much says it all. I mean, mm. a Republican come is about to obtain a position of significant power. Then this story comes out and after he obtains it, it's like the, the, the Donald Trump rape allegations after the uh access hollywood tape that came out there were like about 20 women who said oh yeah trump you know like he did this touching to me but after he became president they all disappeared they never pursued the allegations further mm -hmm. but one thing that i should point out about ford blasey ford is that she has set back uh victims of sexual assault because of the fact that she has made allegations, hasn't been able to substantiate them and is not going to pursue them any further. So it's gonna make anyone who is who is a legitimate victim, a legitimate victim, it's making it so much harder for them to come forward and say, such and such person in power assaulted or abused me, you know? And, and you know, I'm actually a little bit angry about that. Because yeah, I it's just, it's just wrong you know you don't you don't lie about things like that that's just that's a no-no that's that's in the list of things that you just don't do tim, tim next time we do a podcast remind me to write up a list of uh, or a little whiteboard and then actually show it up to everyone on the camera and put it out there it's like things you don't do yeah, and you saw the shrieking of the of the left when uh, the the confirmation hearings and the vote was taking place. I mean, you saw these feminists; they were screeching at the lawmakers, and basically, their their argument was that whether he was guilty or not, if you confirm Kavanaugh, it will uh, tr it will cause uh, extra trauma for for rape survivors, even though it's it's got nothing to do with their individual cases. Uh, uh, like somehow uh, the, uh, this will uh, uh, th this will cause them even more stress. I mean, basically trying to guilt trip uh, these lawmakers into into not voting for Kavanaugh. And how is how are they not taking these women's allegations seriously because they vote for Kavanaugh? I mean, I'm pretty sure that these uh, these feminists who say that they're survivors of sexual assault, I'm sh I'm sure that you know everybody has the utmost sympathy for them, but that's got nothing to do with Kavanaugh's confirmation. Exactly, Tim. It's about collectivized guilt. They say, oh, if you do, if you, if you confirm Kavanaugh, you are collectively punishing every single rape victim. That's the insinuation, which is incorrect, by the way, that they are making it in the trace. It's a sort of emotional blackmail. It's like, you, you don't want to do you don't want to hurt these people, do you? They've already suffered enough. You don't want to hurt them more, do you? It's collectivization of guilt. That's what it is. You know, make everyone feel guilty because of one unsubstantiated allegation, or actually three in the case of um, um, Kavanaugh. But you get the idea, don't you? It's just a matter of, it's just a matter of, you know, feelings over facts 
subjectivity over objectivity. Yeah, and obviously the reason that the Democrats, they so ferociously went after Kavanaugh is because it would give, or in their view, it would basically give the, the conservatives a majority on the Supreme Court five to four. And of course, they're, uh, they're, they're all petrified that Roe versus Wade is going to be overturned, that they think that's the worst thing that could uh, ever happen. So that, that's why they threw, threw, it, threw everything at Kavanaugh and they didn't care that they were dragging a, a good man through the mud because for, uh, for the left, the, the ends uh, justifies uh, the means. Mm-hmm. But that's they've just, right. They've just set their cause back because the the rest of America is has looked at this sideshow the last few weeks and said, "Is that who the Democrats, the left, and progressives have become?" I'm probably going to vote for Trump in the midterms, mm, or at least for the Republicans in the midterms. Yeah, mm. I actually, in regards to the midterms, I suspect that the Republicans will probably hold on to the Senate even if they lose the House. Well, it's going to be it's going to be close. Um, I don't think uh, Elizabeth Warren, aka Pocahontas, is up the cause this way. <laughs> oh dear! Like when I saw the results of that of that test, it's like, so how far back was this Amerindian heritage? Hmm. Okay. So my uh, so the little bit of Irish heritage I have is actually much more recent. And much more integral to my actual genetics than your Amerindian connection. God only knows how many decades ago, how many centuries ago, even. You know, and you know, what, what was that poll that was done? You know, she has less Native American DNA in her than than the average than the American average. For goodness' sake. Uh, uh, the state of the American left. Uh, and we didn't even get to mention the, the non-playable character meme that's been wrecking the internet. <laughs> NPCs always wreck games. You should know that. <laughs> uh, it's, just, it's just exploded this week. Twitter accounts uh, had be, uh, are being banned. Uh, everyone's freaking out. But yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> we've digressed quite a bit on tonight's show. Well, it is. We are recording this on a Friday night. We're allowed to. But we, but we got to the uh, the end. We, we caught up on all the news. So uh, thanks, Michael, for, for coming back on. Um, yeah. Will we get more serious next week? Maybe, maybe we'll just continue to be silly like this. It depends what day and depends on how much better I'm feeling. Uh, you've, got, you've got to love painkiller and anti-sinus medication. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. There's still a few more public events before year's end. There is Gavin McGuinness touring Australia in November. He is visiting Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth. He is being hosted by Penthouse Australia and you can book your place, including various VIP passes, by going to gavinlive.com.au. If you want to take a stand against Antifa violence, there is another free speech rally happening in Melbourne, hosted by the Australian Freedom of Speech Movement. I spoke at their first rally, which was held earlier this year. This latest one is being held on Saturday the 1st of December at 12pm in the Melbourne CBD. Also remember, we cannot do all the work that we do at The Unshackled without your support. The best form of support is becoming a patron of The Unshackled over at patreon.com slash The Unshackled. Or like many of you have been doing recently, send us a direct contribution via our PayPal me slash The Unshackled link, which all helps us keep us going here. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next episode. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.